Well, believe it or not, a new year has begun. Hey, it's now the year 2022. That means the year that was 2021 and all that came with, uh, came with it is in the rear view. And being the beginning of a new year, this tends to be a time where people reflect on the previous year, the lessons learned, the mistakes that were made, the things that they'd wish they'd done better, and then they look forward to the year ahead. And they might even set some goals and make some New Year's resolutions accordingly. It's a time where people take stock of their lives and maybe set a goal or two for the next 12 months. It usually goes something like this. Last year I gained some weight, and so this year I'm going to eat more healthy and work out more and lose some weight. Or last year I watched too much TV, and so this year I'm going to read more. I'm going to try and read maybe a book a month or a book every other week. For a lot of Christians, unfortunately, last year I started a new Bible reading plan, but as soon as I hit Leviticus, I gave up. And so this year I'm going to pick a different Bible reading plan, and I'm going to get through Leviticus, and I'm going to follow through to the end. Now, generally speaking, I think setting New Year's resolutions is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's good to exercise more. It's good to read more. It's good to eat more healthy. Good to get in God's Word, obviously. The problem for many is not with establishing New Year's resolutions. The problem is what? It's following through on them. So it's estimated that 40 to 50% of people come up with some sort of New Year's goal or resolution list. But of these people, about 25% of them, 25% give up on their new goals after the first week. After the first week. And, of the, and the vast majority of the remaining 75% will give up on them by the end of the year, if not much earlier. And so this all begs the question, why? Why are people so quick to give up on their new goals for a new year? Well, there's probably many contributing factors that we could talk through, but I think the main reason would have to be a lack of priority. If someone truly believed that their new goal, that their new resolution was a priority in their life, then they would follow through with it, would they not? And here's what I want to do this morning as I preach from Philippians 3. I want to give you the only resolution that you need this year. Whether you're someone that sets New Year's resolutions or New Year's goals or not, you need this one. This resolution has to be a priority in your life. In fact, it's an all-encompassing priority. It should be your priority of priorities as a Christian. Are you ready for it? Your New Year's resolution for this next year? Here it is. To know Christ more. That's it. That's the only resolution you really need at the end of the day for 2022. To know Christ more. This is the primary goal of the Christian life. This activity should encompass all other activities. It should all flow out of our pursuit of a knowledge of Jesus Christ. Why do I go to church every Sunday? To know Christ more. Why do I go to small group to study the word, to confess my sins to others, to pray for one another, to know Christ more? Why do I get a job and try and work hard, to know Christ more? Why should I get married? Why should I seek to serve my spouse every day and disciple my family to know Christ more? It all comes down to that one singular pursuit. You can boil your entire life in Christ to this one primary goal, this one primary activity to know Jesus Christ more. And the pursuit of the knowledge of Christ should characterize your entire life. And so one of the wonderful things about being a Christian is that our life is not aimless. It's not about just going to work every day, making money, trying to live the good life, and then one day we die. Our life is not without purpose. We have a goal to attain. There's something that we're striving for, something that we're pursuing with vigor. And it's the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And of course, this is more than just an intellectual knowledge. When the Bible uses the word knowledge or to know, oftentimes it connotes an intimacy. It's an experiential and a spiritual knowledge of Jesus Christ. 
It's to love and experience Jesus such that we're changed by him. The more you truly know him, the more you will become like him. The more that you seek to love him, the more you'll obey him, the Bible says. They go hand in hand. The central component of our sanctification is to know Jesus Christ. And so this then becomes the primary goal of the Christian life, to know Christ more. So let me read Philippians 3, 12 to 16, and then I'll pray. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, But I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in prayer. We've gathered here together because ultimately we want to hear from you. We want to hear from your word that we might know you more and know your son whom you have sent. And so pray that you would teach us from your word this morning, that you would increase our knowledge of the Savior, that you would save the lost, that you would build your church, that you'd anoint me with your spirit through the preaching. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The primary goal of the Christian life is to know Christ more. And this is really the main point in the text. I'll probably say this point over and over and over again. Where do I get this? Well, look at verse 13 quickly. It says, but one thing I do. This phrase should immediately have our attention. If the Apostle Paul is able to boil down the entire Christian life to the pursuit of one thing, to the pursuit of one primary activity, then I want to know what that is. If Paul is to devote his life to one thing primarily above all else, I want to know what that one thing is so that I too can devote myself to that one thing. Agreed? What is the one thing he's in pursuit of? Well, it's alluded to several times in the text. In verse 12, he says, not that I have already obtained this. Later in the verse, he says, I press on to make it my own. In verse verse 13, he says, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. And then in verse 14, he says, I press on toward the goal. So what is he talking about? What hasn't he obtained? What is he pressing on to make his own? What is this goal? What's he referring to here? Well, to answer this question, of course, we have to Look at the context, the verses that precede this passage. So I want to read verses 8 to 11 to you. He says, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection of the dead. The one thing that Paul is focused on is knowing Jesus Christ, right? He counts everything as loss in his life compared to the surpassing worth of what? Of knowing Christ. He suffered the loss of all things so that he may know Christ. He may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings and become like him in his death. And so this is the one singular pursuit, the one thing he's committed to. And this too must be our one thing as well. It must be our primary goal to know Christ more, that we might share in his sufferings and become like him. And so even though the goal is not explicitly stated in verses 12 to 16, it's referred to again and again and again because he has just stated it in verses 8 to 11. It's the one thing he's striving for. And as we look at verses 12 to 16, we're going to look at what's required of us in this all-encompassing pursuit to know Jesus. And we're going to see five things, five things. In this lifelong race to know Christ more, 
First, number one, don't ever think you've arrived. Don't ever think you've arrived. Paul says in verse 12, not that I am already, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. In verse 13, he says, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. And so Paul here, despite suffering the loss of all things, despite being an apostle who wrote most of the New Testament, despite being in a jail cell right now as he writes this letter, sharing in the sufferings of Christ, despite all these things, he knew that he had not yet arrived. He knew there was still work to be done. And he obviously had not experienced the resurrection of the dead yet. And so he was not made perfect, even though he'd been sanctified, even though he'd grown in Christ, all these things were true. He had not yet arrived. Notice here, he's equating some of what he just said in verses 8 to 11 with sanctification. Because he says he's not already perfect, lest his readers might reach that conclusion because of what he just said. The more you seek to know Christ, the more you will grow in holiness. In sanctification, that means being set apart, becoming more like Jesus. Knowing Christ and becoming like him are two sides of the same coin. And so Paul here realizes that he's not perfect. He's not yet sanctified. He doesn't yet fully know Christ. He still struggles with sin. And so there's still work to be done. He's not arrived. He hasn't obtained it yet. We know that sinless perfection in this life, of course, is impossible. Until the resurrection of the dead, we will constantly battle against sin in our lives. You cannot attain sinlessness on this side of heaven, on this side of glory. The Bible says in 1 John 1 verse 8, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And so if we believe we're sinless, the Bible says the truth's not even in us. And this means then, of course, that we never fully arrive in the Christian life until death. Our pursuit of Christ and sanctification in Him will not be fully realized until the resurrection of the dead. And so we can never conclude that we've arrived. In fact, I would argue the more that we mature and grow in Christ, the more aware of our own sinfulness we become. And we actually come to realize that we're more sinful than we even thought. That the breadth and the depth of our sin is a lot further than we thought it was. Isn't that the way it goes? We see this in Paul's life. The more Paul matured in Christ, the more aware of his own sinfulness and depravity he became. The more he came to know Christ, the more he saw his sin in the light of Christ's holiness. We see this in Paul. There's a progression in Paul's writings, and I've always found this fascinating. So in, in 56 AD, listen to how Paul refers to himself in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9, written around 56 AD, he says this, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. And so Paul says, I'm the least of the apostles. And there's a level of humility in that, right? He uses the word least. He looks at all the apostles and he thinks, I'm the least of them. But I would say at the end of the day, you're still an apostle. That's, that's pretty good, right? That's like saying, I'm the least of all the Olympians on the men's Olympic national team, hockey team. Okay, you might be the least, but you're still on the Olympic hockey team. That's pretty good. You're still an Olympian. And so you might be the least of the apostles, Paul, but you're still an apostle. Look at what he says a few years later, five years later or so, in Ephesians 3, verse 8. He says, To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And so now, five years later, as he's grown in godliness over those five years, he says, I'm the least of all the saints. Okay, that's quite a bit lower on the spiritual totem pole, right? He goes from being the least of the apostles, now he's the least of the saints. But he's still a saint, right? He's the least of the saints, he's not the least of all. Look at what he says a few years later, around A.D. 63-64 in 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. He says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, 
that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. That's present tense. That's not who I was the foremost in my former life when I persecuted the church. He said, I am the foremost. In the presence, he believed he was the foremost of sinners. Why would he say that? He's much more sanctified than he was when he said he was the least of the apostles. Now he looks out at the entire world and he says, I'm the worst. I'm the chief of sinners. How does he go from least of the apostles to the foremost of sinners? It's because the more he came to know Jesus Christ, the more he saw his own sinfulness. The more he came to know Christ, the more he came to know how valuable Christ is, and the more he, became to, he, he came to know how valuable Christ is, the more he saw the real weight of his own sin. That even the littlest of sins was severe enough that Jesus Christ had to give his invaluable life on the cross as payment for it. And so in Paul's mind, he was the worst of sinners. Of course he hadn't arrived yet. He became more and more aware of his own thought patterns and the sinfulness that existed in them. He became more and more aware of how short he fell of all those positive commands that we learned about a few weeks ago, that he does not love God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength every moment of every day. He's probably never done that fully for one moment. And so he concludes he's the worst of sinners. He wasn't perfect. There's work to be done. So I'll flip that on you. How about you? Are you quick to acknowledge your own sinfulness in a situation? Are you quick and humble enough to admit when you've fallen short of the glory of God in whatever way that might be? Do you believe that there's still a lot of work to be done in your life? Hopefully you don't look around at others and think, I'm not as bad as them. Because Paul looks around at others and says, he's the chief of sinners. There ought to be humility. There's a lot of running imagery and language used in this passage in Philippians 3. And it's basically, Paul's referring to our walk with Christ and our pursuit of knowing him as a race. Well, if it's a race, then it's a marathon, right? It's not a 100-meter dash. And I have a news flash for all of you this morning. You're not at the finish line left uh, yet. You're not at the finish line. There's still progress to be made. And so we cannot grow complacent in our sanctification. We cannot ever think that we've arrived because we simply haven't. So in this next year, keep reading your Bible. Keep coming to church. Keep, killing to, keep seeking to kill sin at all costs. Keep loving your wife. Keep discipling your kids and your family. Keep serving others because the race is far from over. Press on. I believe this call is especially pertinent for older folks. Because I think older folks, especially in our culture, older folks that have been Christians for a long time, they can think that they reach a time in their life where they can just coast, coast to the finish line. I would encourage you, if that's you, never stop growing and pursuing to know Christ more. You haven't arrived yet. You don't have a perfect knowledge of Christ yet. He's unsearchable. You barely scratched the surface. So press on, believer, whether young or old, press on. Don't grow complacent. Listen to what John Calvin said about this. He said, Thus, for example, should anyone persuade himself that he has made sufficiently great progress, reckoning that he has done enough, he will become indolent or complacent and feel inclined to deliver up his lamp to others. Or if anyone looks back with a feeling of regret for the situation that he has abandoned, he cannot apply the whole bent of his mind to what he is engaged in. And so that, transi that transitions nicely to the next point, what Calvin said there at the end. In this lifelong race to know Christ more, don't ever think you're, you've arrived. And number two, don't look back. Don't look back. Look at verse 13. It says, brothers... I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. And look at the first thing he says after he says, one thing I do. 
forgetting what lies behind. In order to press on to know Christ more, there's no time for looking back. And I've always found this phrase very curious, especially as I weigh it against the rest of Scripture. Because how often in Scripture are we commanded to remember? What do we just partake in? Communion. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. So there's a command to remember. What did the Israelites do in 1 Samuel 7 to remember how God had delivered them from the Philistines? They raised an Ebenezer stone so that every time their children and their children's children would see that stone, they would remember how God was faithful to deliver them. And so on the one hand, we have these commandments in Scripture to remember. But on the other hand, we're told to imitate Paul, to follow his example, and he says he forget what lies behind. He forgets. And so how do we reconcile these two concepts? What exactly are we supposed to forget? What's he talking about? Well, from the context of this very chapter, we know that he can't be talking about God's past faithfulness to him. Because he's just recounted that, in a sense, in verses uh, 7 to 11. And it also can't be about forgetting his pre-Christian past, because he's recounted that in verses 1 to 6. And so this phrase here doesn't mean that we try and vacate our minds of everything that's ever happened to us in the past, as if that were even possible. That's not what he's talking about. What Paul's talking about here is pr primarily is not living in the past. And so one commentary defined the word for forgetting this way. To forget in the biblical sense of the word is not simply to obliterate from the mind, if that is indeed possible. It is rather the opposite of remembering, which as a biblical term carries the important dynamic meaning of a recalling from the past into the present of an action which lies buried in history in such a way that the result of the past action is made potently present. In other words, forgetting what lies behind is not living in the past as though it were still your present. You can see how that would impede future progress. Forgetting what lies behind. Not looking back and remembering easier times, the good old days, getting stuck in a constant state of nostalgia that prevents you from moving forward, wishing our times were like a former time. So easy to do. And then we sit around and do nothing. It's not looking back and wishing you'd done something differently and then being so stuck in that situation that you regret that you can't move on from it. It's not looking back at past sins. Sins that have already been dealt with on the cross of Jesus Christ. Sins that maybe you've already been given victory over, but you're still living as though the guilt remains and the eternal consequences remain, even though they've been dealt with. We remember the past faithfulness of God, and then we use that to motivate us to press on to the future. We don't dwell on past regrets or on past hurts or on easier times. We don't even dwell on past progress of our own, lest it impede our current and future progress and quell the sense of urgency that we ought to feel. Now listen to what the commentator J.A. Motyer said about this. He said, what then is this forgetting of the past which he uses with such emphasis? It is the sort of dwelling on the past that hinders our present effort and our future progress. We do well to remind ourselves that a bereavement can sometimes make Christians live in the past. Similarly, we easily harbor a persistent bitterness about past wrongs, real or supposed. There are few things that have such power to lock us into the past. Again, there is despair over past sins, which in its severest form can make believers doubt if they will ever be forgiven, or which in less tragic forms give rise to defeatism and backward looking. By contrast, the progressing Christian must cultivate a concentrated forward look to where the goal lies. I like what he said there. It is the sort of dwelling on the past that hinders our present effort and our future progress. This speaks to me as someone who is sometimes susceptible to this. Here at the beginning of 2022, if I'm honest, I believe I would have two temptations when it comes to this concept. Number one... I could look back to pre-COVID life 
and experience a certain level of nostalgia, remembering when things were much simpler in the world, remembering a time where there was less division in society, where there was less division amongst churches, where there was less division in families, less persecution of Christians, where the government seemed to be less antagonistic toward churches. Things seemed to be easier. I could look back to those days and get caught in a state of nostalgia. I think some people are doing that right now. They're just waiting for life to go back to what it used to be, and that's impeding any future progress. And so we must be careful of this. But on the other hand, 2021 was such a fruitful and adventurous year in so many ways, especially for our church, that I could also be tempted to look back and maybe in a weird way finding myself longing to go through some of the same crises that we went through as a church because they were so sanctifying and so fruitful and sometimes even fun, dare I say it. But if we do this, then we, we, can, we, we run the risk of getting stuck in the events of the last year and fail to adequately strain forward and move on to the year ahead and whatever new situations the Lord may bring our way. I used to do track and field as a kid in elementary school. I didn't do it in high school. I don't think I was fast enough. <laughs> but I did it in elementary school, and one of the... the First things a track and field coach will tell you as you prepare and get ready for a race is what? Don't look back. Don't look back. Because as soon as you look back, as soon as you take your eyes off the finish line, what happens? You slow down. Because you're not singularly focused on that one goal anymore. So you can look this up on YouTube. There's examples of people in famous races running and for a split second they look over their shoulder to see where the other runners are at and what happens. Another runner goes right by them and they lose the race. Are you tempted to look back and to dwell on the past? Maybe for you it's a past success. Maybe it's a past hurt. Maybe it's a past regret. Maybe even as you look over the past year, it was a very difficult year for you. Maybe you experienced job loss or the loss of a loved one, the loss of a relationship the pain of a child going wayward, or maybe just, just the cloud that our whole culture is under right now and the added weight and burden that it brought you over the last year, this, as a result, has you stuck. You're stuck thinking about easier and happier times, wishing that they would return. Or you're stuck dwelling on those regrets that you have or the past hurt that you've experienced. May the Spirit help you move on. Move on to what lies ahead. You, you can't get stuck in the past. Yes, learn from it. Remember what God has done, his faithfulness. But then you need to quickly move on to what lies ahead. Press on, Paul says, twice. So as we enter into this new year, we cannot backward look. We cannot look back. Yes, we celebrate what God has done. We remember his past faithfulness. But at the end of the day, we're not stuck in 2021. We're moving on. May the Spirit help us in this. In this lifelong race to know Christ more, don't look back. Don't look back. Next, number three, press on to what lies ahead. Press on to what lies ahead. Three times Paul communicates to us the urgency that we ought to move forward in this race. In verse 12 he says, I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. He presses on. Verse 13, he says, One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. And verse 14, he says, I press on toward the goal. So he presses on, he strains forward, he presses on. Uh, the word translated press on uh, comes from the world of sports. And it means to vigorously pursue can be used of a runner in a race who's vigorously pursuing the prize, vigorously pursuing the finish line. In using the word, Paul's emphasizing the urgent and the strenuous nature of the pursuit of Christ and of sanctification in Him. And he uses the word twice, press on, press on. When things are repeated, that means it's being emphasized. 
Again, we're reminded here there's no room for complacency in the Christian life. We cannot stagnate. We cannot get stuck. We, cannot, we need to move forward to know Christ and to grow in his likeness. And I believe that many Christians maybe understand this intellectually, but functionally, many Christians live as though we don't have a role to play in our sanctification. And so we believe that our justification and our salvation is all of God. We don't contribute anything to that. We know that from Romans, or sorry, from Philippians 3 verse 9 here, where it says that we have a righteousness uh, that is from God, not a righteousness that we've earned. And so our justification, we don't contribute anything to it. But it's not the same with our sanctification. Our sanctification requires effort on our part. Okay, we can't just recline in a lazy boy and expect the Lord to sanctify us. That's not the way it works. It requires effort. The pursuit of Christ and his likeness involves work and discipline and focus and energy and time. If you were to read through Philippians, you'd see that Paul's alluded to this several times in the book. In chapter 1, verse 27, he calls the, Philippian, the Philippians to stand firm and to strive side by side. In chapter 2, verse 12, he calls them to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. In chapter 2, verse 16, in referring to his own relationship with Christ, he uses words like run and labor. So in this book, he uses words like strive, work out, run, labor. Why? How can he use words like this? Because sanctification requires effort. We contribute something to our sanctification. There's no time for laziness or for complacency. So let me ask you, how's your sanctification going? Now's a good time to take stock. Are you pressing on in your walk with Christ? Are you relentless in your pursuit of Christ? Is there urgency in your life to know Christ more and to strain forward to what lies ahead? If you look back over the past year, can you say that you're holier, you've grown in the knowledge of Christ uh, than you were a year ago? You're better off in Christ. Maybe the answer to some of those questions is no. And if that's the case, we could ask a lot of diagnostic questions in response. If you say, no, I'm not really growing in Christ right now. But I want to boil it down to one question. Or at least I want to ask you one question that I think is very important. How's your time in the Word and in prayer going? So I believe 90%, maybe even 99% of the time, if someone's stuck... If they're in a spiritual desert, if they're not growing in Christ, it's because they're not in the Word and in prayer enough. And sometimes people say, but I don't really have a hunger for God's Word right now. And so I'm just waiting for God to reignite that passion for His Word, and then I'll dig into it again. And to that I say, that's not how it works. You have to discipline yourself to be in God's Word, and as you discipline yourself to be in God's Word, the hunger will come. Discipline precedes delight. Discipline precedes delight. Duty precedes desire. And so the beginning of a new year is a great time to recommit to spending regular time in God's word. If you want to grow in your knowledge of Christ, where do you have to go to do that? The Bible. This is where we learn about who Jesus is and what he's done for us. This is where we commune with him and grow in our relationship and understanding of him. There's no shortcuts so maybe you need to get a Bible reading plan, get some accountability in your life, and get into God's Word. If you read God's Word every day this year, you spend time with Him every day, then I guarantee you a year from now you'll look back and you'll see growth in your life. You'll have grown in your knowledge of Jesus Christ. But if you neglect God's Word for this next year, then at the end of the year you'll either be stuck where you are, but more likely you'll probably be further behind than where you are right now in your walk with him. The more you spend time with Christ in his word and in prayer, the more you spend time with him seeking to know him, the more you'll become like him. This is how it works. I've been married to my wife now for over 10 years. We celebrated our 10 year anniversary this past fall. And as I consider our relationship, 
and compare who we are now to who we were 10 years ago, I can see in many ways we've become like each other. This is what happens when we spend time together, right? The more we rub off on each the more we spend time with each other, the more we rub off on each other. And we start, start to adopt each other's habits and idiosyncrasies for better or for worse. And so one of my subconscious habits, and I think I probably picked this up from my father when growing up with him as a kid, is I'll walk from place to place in the house and I'll just snap. I know, it's kind of strange, I don't know. I walk from room to room and I just snap in the hallways. And this used to drive my wife nuts. And she would point out every time she'd catch me snapping my fingers and how much it annoyed her. Well, here we are, 10 years later, and guess who's snapping now? <laughs> because the more time that you spend with someone, the more time you spend with someone, the more you become like them. The staff are all laughing because they can think of me snapping my fingers in the hallways here. <laughs> So if you want to press on to what lies ahead this year, if you want to grow in Christ and grow in His likeness, then you need to spend time with Him. And there ought to be a sense of urgency to this. It shouldn't just be something you do if you have time left over in your day. It should just be something you do if your schedule allows for it. It ought to be a priority in your life, an all-encompassing priority. No excuses. There's no exceptions. You can't even say, oh, I, d I don't know how to read because we have technology now that will read God's word to you. And the more you do this, the more you'll want to do this. God will grow that hunger and that passion in your life. The one thing Paul was devoted toward is knowing Christ. In this lifelong race to know Christ more, here's the fourth thing, number four. Remember the prize that awaits you. Remember the prize that awaits you. Why does Paul run this race? He runs to acquire a prize. He sets his eyes on the finish line, on the goal, because he knows that once he reaches that goal, he's going to receive a prize. Verse 14, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He refers to this prize as the prize of the upward call, the, the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. What exactly is this prize? What will he receive when he finishes the race? Once he receives the resurrection of the dead that he talked about in verse 11. Well, this prize would include all of the blessings and the rewards in the life to come. It's the prize of hearing the words spoken of us, well done, good and faithful servant. It's the prize of the eternal inheritance that is ours being co-heirs with Christ. It's the prize of the unfading crown of glory that the Apostle Peter talks about. Ultimately, though, it's the full knowledge of Christ and the full experience of his presence. That's the prize. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says this, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Ultimately, the prize Paul is running toward is Christ himself. And so in this life, we're vigorously pursuing him, we're running after him, we're looking to the finish line, and it's as though he's there at the finish line waiting for us. We fix our eyes on him at that finish line, and as soon as we cross it, we're with him face to face. And we have the chance to have a full knowledge of him, to fully know him even as he has fully known us. Or as Paul says in this text, we will be able to make him our own even as he has made us his own. And let me tell you this, Christian, that day will be worth whatever you have to go through in this life. No matter how difficult this race may be at times, that day, the day when you receive the prize, it will make it all worth it. And so Paul fixes his eyes on the prize. I believe this is one of the antidotes to getting yourself unstuck from the past. So if you're stuck in the past for whatever reason, you can't get past something, fix your eyes on eternity. Set your mind on things that are above the Bible says. Discipline yourself to do that. Think about what is awaiting those who continue to press on. Think about how awesome it will be to receive the prize. Think about the pleasures forevermore that are at the right hand of God waiting for you. 
Think about what it will be like most of all to fully know Christ and be with him. The more you think about these things and train your mind to do that, again, it takes work and effort, the less stuck you'll be in the past thinking about temporal earthly things that in the grand scheme of things don't really matter, eternally speaking. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 to 18. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to things that are seen, but to things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. A runner who's in a race doesn't think too much about the past progress he's made in the race. He doesn't think too much during the race about what he could have done differently or about how he should have ran that one stretch faster. He doesn't think about these things. He's focused on finishing the race and on trying to receive the prize that's awaiting him. So we must discipline ourselves to do the same. Whatever the next 12 months have in store for us, as individuals or as a church, as families, may we remember the prize that is awaiting us on that day. And may that give us all the motivation we need to press on, to strain forward, to forget what lies behind, to persevere. In this lifelong race to know Christ more, we must remember the prize that is awaiting us. And finally, number five, let us run this race together. Let us run this race together, verses 15 and 16. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. So notice here that there's a switch from verse 14 to verse 15. Paul goes from talking about himself in his own example to now exhorting the Philippians to do the same. This is why I've preached so far that we ought to make the one thing that Paul makes the one thing, the one thing in our lives. We too ought to forget what lies behind and press on to what lies ahead. Why? Because Paul says here, those who are mature in Christ think this way. And those who are less mature and don't have this sense of urgency, God will reveal that to them in time, and they too will pursue Christ above all else. Paul's example is a pattern for us to follow. And then in verse 16, he tells us, he exhorts us to hold fast to what he's just taught, that we might continue to live it out in the future and continue to press on and pursue Christ more and more for the rest of our lives. But what I want to focus on in these two verses is the communal nature of these exhortations. He says twice, let us, let us. He doesn't say let you, he says let us. This is important. Let us all live this way together. Let all of us continue to hold true to this confession, this truth, together. In fact, one commentator said of this phrase, let us hold true, he said it has overtones of a collective discipline, of each of us walking in the same row or by the same measure. As I mentioned, Paul says earlier that we're to strive together side by side in chapter 1, verse 27. And so the picture is that we're all running the race together. And we each have our own lane. And we're running side by side toward the goal. And when we see someone fall behind, we encourage them to press on. We pick them up and help them run the race. We encourage one another in this race that we're all running together side by side. We encourage one another to press on. We hold each other accountable to continue. We live out the one another's of Scripture together. There's a small reminder in these verses that sanctification is a community project. You cannot grow in sanctification in isolation, properly anyways. You cannot live out the one another commands of Scripture if you're not with one another. You cannot be held accountable without the involvement of others in your walk with Christ. This, of course, is one of the arguments for why in-person fellowship is so necessary. Because we need each other. We need to strive together. It's foolish for a Christian to isolate himself. We need to strive together toward a greater knowledge of Jesus Christ. We're, we're running the race together. That's good news. You're not alone. 
You've got us. We're going to help you. We're going to do what it takes to get you to that finish line. This is the body of Christ. This is the church. The primary goal of your life in Christ is to know him more. And that's not just intellectual, that's experiential. The more you know Christ, the more you'll become like him. And as you run this lifelong race, don't ever think that you've arrived. Don't look back and get stuck in the past. Instead, press on to what lies ahead. Focus on the prize that awaits you. And remember that you're not alone. That we're all in this together with you. Maybe you're here this morning and you've been hearing me preach about how we need to know Christ more, know Christ more, know Christ more. And if you're honest, you don't even know Christ. You don't even have a relationship with him. You don't even know where to begin. You're not a Christian. If that's you, I would invite you to come to the Savior this morning that you may know him and the power of his resurrection. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants you to know him. You might say, how do I get started? The Bible says you need to repent. You need to acknowledge your sinfulness before a holy God. And you may not fully understand the depths of your sinfulness yet, but at the very least, you need to acknowledge that you are a sinner and you've transgressed the law of a holy God. And because of that, you deserve eternal punishment. Confess your sins, be specific, forsake them, and then put your faith in Jesus Christ. Believe he died on the cross for you. His body was broken, his blood was shed as payment for your sin because he desires that relationship with you. And then he rose again on the third day and if you repent and you believe that truth, you'll be forgiven of all your sins, you'll be saved, and you'll be granted eternal life. And do you know how the Bible defines eternal life, by the way? John 17 verse 3 says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And so you'll enter into this relationship with Jesus, this eternal life that will begin now and, and forevermore, growing in the knowledge of the Savior. That's eternal life, growing in your knowledge of the Savior. Come to Jesus this morning if you haven't. And for the rest of us, may 2022 be a year where we all press on and move forward in our pursuit of Jesus Christ, no matter what may come our way, whether more persecution, whether more suffering or hardship, or maybe this next year will be a season of unopposed faithful, fruitfulness. May we never become hopelessly nostalgic about the past or complacent in the present. But may we pursue Christ with vigor. That's what it means to press on. May we pursue him in his word. May we pursue him in prayer. May we pursue him through regular church attendance. May we pursue him through family worship. And whatever we do, whether it's working hard at a job or whether it's changing dirty diapers or whether it's studying for our university courses, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, may we do it all for the glory of God in the pursuit of Jesus Christ. That we may know him in the power of his resurrection. That we may share in his sufferings and become like him in his death. I don't know about you, but at the end of the day, at the end of this year, I just want to be more like Jesus. If a year from now I can look back and say I'm a little bit more like Jesus than whatever happens this year, it was worth it. I just want more of his humility. I want more of his purity. I want more of his strength. I want more of his patience. I want more of his love. I want more of his meekness. I want more of his courage and his boldness and his toughness. I want more of his kindness. I want more of his grace. I just want to be like Jesus. May it be so. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus.